This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. For God has shown thee what is good. And what does the Lord require of thee but to do justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with our God. Good morning. We welcome you this morning to the Andrew Rankin Memorial Chapel here in Crampton Auditorium. And we pray God's blessings upon you as we seek to worship our God in spirit and in truth. We're going to ask Miss um, Sydney Wardlaw to come at this time to light our unity candle. Sydney is a chapel assistant and a junior biology major, chemistry and Spanish double minor from Charlotte, North Carolina. At this time, Ms. Natoy Fowlero, one of our graduate assistants here in the office of the dean of the chapel, will come and lead us through today's service. Greetings, chapel family. Greetings. Greetings. It's a pleasure to be here another time before you. We'd like to thank Aaliyah Wilson, our bell ringer. She is a freshman psychology major, business administration minor from Charlotte County, Virginia. At this time, we'll be asking Reverend Christopher Bonner, a graduate assistant here in the office of the Dean of the Chapel, um, to come and read our scripture. Following the scripture, we'll be having a musical selection by Andrew Rankin Memorial Chapel Choir, directed by Dr. Eric Poole. Good morning, Chapel family. This week's scripture comes from Psalm 89, verses 14 through 16, and I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version, updated edition. And it reads, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. Happy are the people who know the festival shout, who walk, O Lord, in the light of your countenance. They exalt in your name all day long and extol your righteousness. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you. 
give them another hand clap because that was beautiful. At this time, I would like to acknowledge our offering. Our offering will be collected after service in the baskets in the back. Donations can be made online using the QR code in your bulletins. Um, and also, if you are online watching, we thank you for watching. And if you would like to contribute as well, you can give at giving.howard.edu forward slash rankinchapel.com. Um, and today we have Pulsa Chapel. We have Miss Monica Moore, our chapel assistant's president, and she will be coming up. If you do have a call to chapel, please meet us at the left side of the stage. And as Miss Monica Moore is coming up, we would like to take this moment to acknowledge our speaker's assistant, Mr. Deshaun Jones. <laughs> Deshaun Jones is a junior mathematics major, economics minor from Clearwater, Florida. Thank you. Good morning, Chapel family. I hope you guys are doing good so far on this wonderful chapel service. Perfect. As we settle in, I want you all to know that it may seem overwhelming now as we all get adjusted back to the semester, but you all are more than capable of succeeding at everything you have in store for this semester. For our chapel fun fact of the week, the Andrew Rankin Memorial Chapel, located on the yard, is designated as a National Historic Landmark. This week in the chapel, we will be having our Meditation Mondays online with our very own Dean Richardson every Monday at 9 a.m. on all Rankin Chapel social media. We also will be having Wellness Wednesdays, which are essential for your um, wellness throughout the week, a midweek booster. And they're also taught by our Howard University's wellness team, also in the Little Chapel at 12.15 p.m. on Wednesdays. Also, we will be having a chapel assistance meeting this week. For the chapel assistance meeting this Friday, we will be going ice skating at the wharf. We will be leaving the Carnegie Building <laughs> promptly at 4.30 p.m., and we hope to see you there. If you are interested in any of these programs and organizations, chapel assistants would be more than happy to assist you. Will all chapel assistants please stand? Thank you. We will also be having calls to chapel from Alpha Theta Beta Chapter, Chi Beta Phi, Eta Phi Sorority Incorporated. We also will be having the Howard University Community Choir. We will be having the Matters of the Heart Bible Study. And those will be our calls to chapel. Please make sure you're on the um, right-hand side of me, ready to go. And for our quote of the week is, when I dare to be powerful, to use my strength in the service of my vision, then it becomes less and less important whether I am afraid by Audre Lorde. Thank you all and God bless. Greetings all beautiful bison and extended bison family. My name is Shade Johnson, a junior nursing major and vice president of Chi Eta Phi Sorority Incorporated's Alpha Delta Beta chapter for the 2022-2023 school year. Good morning, everybody. My name is Brianna Seward, and I'm a junior nursing major. I have the pleasure of serving as the historian and community service chair for Chi Eta Phi Sorority's Alpha Delta Beta chapter for the 2022-2023 school year. Chi Eta Phi Sorority Incorporated is the professional nursing organization for registered professional nurses and student nurses, male and female, representing many cultures and diverse ethnic backgrounds. Founded at Freedman's Hospital, which is now Howard University's hospital, members of Chi Eta Phi serve a lifetime commitment to elevating the plane of nursing and increasing interest in the nursing field. More than 8,000 registered nurses and student nurses hold membership in Chi Eta Phi Sorority Incorporated. With that being said, we are pleased to present our Spring 2023 Rush Week entitled, Showing Your True Colors, What It Means to Be a Nurse in the Making. With nursing being such a multifaceted career, it is essential to understand how you can exude greatness in every form that you choose. 
through our emphasis on character, education, and friendship, we hope to help you frame your masterpiece in the field of nursing. Thank you, and we hope to see you at this week's events. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Cameron Adams. I am a junior math major and secondary education minor from Los Angeles, California. Hello, my name is Ethiopia Salmon. I'm a speech language pathology graduate student from the Twin Island State of Antigua and Barbuda. We are the Open Call Week leaders for the spring 2023 Open Call Week for HUCC, also the Howard University Community Choir. We are one of the choirs on campus. And first and foremost, we would like to thank Chapel on behalf of the Howard University Community Choir for allowing us to come up in here and get this, um, give this announcement, sorry. We are a choir that is both family oriented and community based, adds an engaging in community service and ministering through song on campus, as well as local areas in the city. We are at home for any students who are looking to share their voice and be welcomed into a community, whether for refuge or like-minded individuals. As said before, this week we will be having our open call week and our theme is Believe For It. There will be a lot of events and activities in store which will take place from 6 to 7.30 p.m. We will also be holding two open rehearsals on Tuesday and Thursday at the CH Multipurpose Room and Carnegie Hall building respectively so that any prospective members can get a feel of what we're all about. Follow us on Instagram at HUCC underscore 1989. HUCC underscore 1989 for more updates. We're going to be posting daily. Tell your neighbor. Tell your friend. Or cousins. <laughs> I now would like to announce our choir by having them to please stand. Thank you. Love you. We hope to see you guys there. <laughs> Greetings, everyone. My name is Maya Chafin. I am a freshman film and television major from Columbus, Ohio. My name is Quarry Robinson. I'm a freshman computer engineering major from Austin, Texas. And we are this year's appointed student leaders along with Brianna Artis for Matters of the Heart Bible Study. If you are interested in creativity, discussions, and community, please join us as we take this time to grow our relationship with God, where we address, dis dissect, and reflect on the true matters of our heart. In this safe space, we will discover and revisit verses and stories in the Bible that help paint our pictures, see through the lenses of others, and listen to the true rhythm of faith, service, justice, and wellness. You are invited to join us every Monday from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. for Matters of the Heart Bible Study at the College Hall South Multipurpose Room, Side A. Thank you. I'd like to thank all of the organizations who had a call to chapel. I want to acknowledge uh, two graduate assistants who are leading the Heart of the Matter Bible Study, Troy and Reverend Bonner. Thank you. Let us now prepare our hearts and our minds for prayer. Let us be still before our God. I'm going to ask you if you would just close your eyes for a moment and take a deep breath and to realize that you are alive. And be grateful for the gift of life the gift of this moment. Mm -hmm. 
Let us pray. Most gracious and loving God, this is the day that you have made. We want to be glad and we want to rejoice in it. We thank you, O oh God, for the, for the precious gift of this new day. A new day to be alive, to be grateful, to be thankful for all that we too often take for granted. A new day to be kind and gentle, not just to others, but to be kind and gentle to ourselves. A new day to love our imperfect selves. A new day to, to remember that you love us with a love that will never let us go. On this new day, Lord, Make us strong within. Let not our, our fears, our weaknesses, and our insecurities get in the way of the life that you created us to live. In this moment, Lord, no matter what we may be going through, remind us of our strengths. Remind us of our possibilities. Remind us of our goodness. Remind us of your power to heal. On this new day, Lord, help us to, to trust ourselves. Help us to be patient with ourselves when we find ourselves in that place where we can't figure things out, when we don't know what to do. Help us, Lord, just to trust ourselves. We are mindful of our past mistakes. But today, Lord, in, in this new day, help us to, to trust ourselves and to, to believe in ourselves again. As we come before you, Lord, we confess that too often, we do not allow ourselves to, to feel all the good that's in our lives. We can't even see it, Lord. We're always in a rush trying to make something happen. We do so, Lord, even though we know that understanding comes real joy and true peace of mind comes and and finds us in our unguarded moments when we're not judging ourselves when we're not trying to prove ourselves when we're just being ourselves so in this new day lord help us to to just relax in your loving and your in your forgiving spirit. Open our eyes, Lord. Open our eyes to, to see and appreciate and care for it and nourish what you have already provided. Speak to our hearts this morning. Comfort us. Reassure us. Remind us that that you have a future and a hope for us. 
Heal us this morning. Heal us this morning. We give you now, Lord. We give you whatever is making us afraid. Whatever is getting in the way of what will make us whole, we, we give to you, Lord. And, and what we are too weak to, or unwilling to surrender, we ask that you just take it from us. Take from us our foolish pride, our, our fear of failing, our, our fear of being rejected, our, our jealousy, our unwillingness to speak truth to power, our, our tendency to look the other way at injustice. Take from us our, our way of believing that, that will not allow us to forgive ourselves and to, to forgive others. Whatever it is, Lord, take it from us. We give to you now not only our concerns, but the concerns of all your people. We who are struggling with sickness and disease, come, Lord, and heal us. We who are grieving the loss of, of a loved one, come for us, Lord. We who are poor, provide for us. We who are in prison, minister to us. We who are being victimized by racism, sexism, and who we choose to love. Come, Lord, and deliver us. And we give to you now our our sick nation. Come, Lord, and let your justice roll down like water and your righteousness like a mighty stream. Come, Lord. We're not going to try to tell you how to fix these things this morning. We're going to let go now. We're going to trust you. We're going to trust you. We're going to trust that you will show us the way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
thanks uh, for this day, and I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge some of our guests this morning. We have uh, Father Boxy, who is our Catholic chaplain with us here. Is he doing tremendous work, for the work that you're doing. Thank you. Uh, we have Dr. Ronald Hobson with us, who is a member of our faculty. I thought I'd hear, and also, uh, in psychi psychology and divinity, and also a chapel speaker. And um, someone special to me, the Reverend Charles Chamberlain, my brother-in-law, visiting from New Jersey. Thank you. We are indeed blessed this morning to have as our preacher the Reverend Dr. Alvin O'Neill Jackson, Senior Strategist for People's Campaign, a National Call for Moral Revival from Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, Dr. Jackson has um, received many degrees besides his earned degrees from Duke and um, United Theological Seminary. He's also received many honorary degrees. He served uh, for over 20 years. He served as the senior pastor of Mississippi Boulevard Christian Church of Memphis, a congregation that experienced phenomenal growth under his leadership. The church had a participating membership of 350 persons when he arrived and grew to over 8,000 participating members making it at the time the largest and fastest growing disciples co congregation in the United States and Canada. Um, Dr. Jackson served as the senior pastor of the National City Christian Church and president of the National City Christian Church Foundation in Washington, D.C. And on his leadership, a traditionally white congregation became increasingly diverse in membership, staff, and styles of worship. In September of 2006, he became senior pastor of Park Avenue Christian Church of New York City. And in September 2016, he retired from active pastoral ministry. Oh, that's not really true. <laughs> He's always ministering. Yeah. He has since become active with the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, serving now as senior strategist with the Poor People's Campaign. Um, what I shared with our students uh, in the green room that um, I consider Dr. Jackson a leader of leaders. And he's one of those persons, he, he, he can do it all. Can you imagine serving a congregation of 8,000 and then he's able to sit, stand on the sidelines working just as hard as he would do if he was leading uh, the, the, um, the organization. Uh, that's a gift. And we need more leaders like that who are willing to serve in whatever capacity God calls that person to, uh, to serve. Amen? So following a selection from the chapel choir under the direction of Dr. Eric O. Poole, uh, City Called Heaven, arranged by Jonathan Walters Suber. I'm sorry, Jonathan Walter Suber is our soloist. <laughs> we will be blessed to experience the preaching and the ministry of Dr. Alvin O'Neill Jackson. Pray for him as he comes to bring us a word from the Lord.
got no hope, got no hope. Trying to make it, make heaven my home. Sometimes I'm tossed and I'm driven. Sometimes I just don't know. God, we thank you for the promise of a city called heaven. We thank you for the hope we have in you. Now may the words of my mouth 
and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Our strength and our redeemer remind us even now that the excellency of the power is not in us but of you. If the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight. And all of God's people said, Amen and Amen. My, 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 my. To my friend and brother of many years, Dean Bernard Richardson, to the incredible staff in the Dean's office, chaplain assistants and liturgists for this service, student leaders, this very fine choir. Let's thank God again for the choir and the musicians, the soloists, Howard University community, family and friends, all it's, and it's, it's wonderful to be back in this place. Um, it's wonderful to look out in the congregation this morning and see a number of very familiar faces uh, from my time some years ago on Thomas Circle, the experiment on Thomas Circle. Uh, so grateful to Gretchen for ch changing her travel plans and getting the right Reverend Monte Hillis here today. It's always a privilege to return to Mecca, this pinnacle of academic excellence and service, this pilgrimage destination of spirit, heart, and head for so many of us. When Dean Richardson called a few days ago and apologized profusely for calling uh, with the invitation, I paused a moment or two, maybe out of surprise, for his reaching out to an old, mostly retired preacher, but quickly accepted after the initial hesitation and grateful for the privilege to be back with you. I want for just a little while this morning to call attention to the book of Habakkuk. The book of Habakkuk. I want to read a few selected verses from chapter 1 and chapter 2. This minor prophet with a major message. Habakkuk chapters 1 and two. Starting with the second verse of chapter one. How long, O Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen. A cry out to you violence, but you do not save. Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing. Destruction and violence are before me. Various strife and conflict abounds. The law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. And chapter 2, I will Stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what God will say to me and what I will answer when I'm corrected. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will surely come. It will not tarry. A vision 
that cannot be denied. A vision that cannot be denied. As we gather here today on this third Sunday after Epiphany, still on the threshold of a new year, still ringing with reflections and remembrances of Dr. King, the cadence of his words, the courage of his witness, still rejoicing in the inauguration of a new governor and a new beginning in the state of Maryland, and moving forward with the re-election of mayoral leadership here in the District of Columbia, and the ongoing presidential search for new leadership for this great institution, and still celebrating an alum, a sister, a Delta Sigma Theta, Madam Vice President. Oh, Madam, Matt, oh, AKA, she's a, yeah, y'all corrected me quickly on that one. Yeah, Miss AKA and Madam Vice President. As we gather, we're reminded that even with the bright lights and pockets of hope, we still need leadership. Our community, our nation, indeed the whole world, the global community, desperately cries out for leadership. This is the great need of our time bold, determined, visionary, courageous, decisive, imaginative, gracious, generous, big-hearted leadership. That's what we need, leadership. Bold, determined, visionary, courageous, decisive, imaginative, gracious, generous, big-hearted leadership. Leadership not just talking the talk, but walking the walk. Leadership rooted and grounded in moral values. Leadership that offers a spiritual, moral, non-anxious presence. Not scared, no failure of nerve, still got some juice in the tank. Real leadership authentic leadership, not mere show and performance. This is, my friends, the great need of our time. Leadership not driven by polls and popularity, but by principles and purpose. Leadership not driven by personal interests, but guided and guarded and based in integrity. Leadership not mere charisma, but character. Leadership not driven by calculations, but convictions. Leadership not based on wealth and privilege and entitlement, but worth and capacity and calling, vocation. We need leadership. We need it in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our churches, in our temples and mosques, our nation, the world over desperately cries out for leadership. And you know, I never cease to be amazed at how current and relevant the ancient scriptures are. It seems the scriptures were written just yesterday for our context and directly addressed to us today. I never cease to be amazed at how current and relevant the ancient scriptures are, and so it is with this beautiful poetry and prophecy from the prophet Habakkuk in the Hebrew scriptures. Habakkuk lived in a decade just before the destruction of Jerusalem, when everything was coming loose at the seams and falling apart. Institutions were no longer respected by the people. 
the office of the leader of the country, the king, the queen, the president, had been cheapened with publicity stunts and claims of fake news and, and tricks and tweets. The courts were polarized and politicized and the Congress was paralyzed. The people were on edge. And this is how the prophet describes the situation. Oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help? And uh, you will not listen. Or cry to you violence and you will not save. Why do you make me see wrongdoing? and look at trouble. Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise, so the law becomes slack and justice never prevails. The wicked surround the righteous, therefore judgment comes forth perverted. It seems as if we've been deserted. Violence, wrongdoing, trouble, destruction, strife, contention, the wicked surrounding the righteous, justice never prevailing. It was a time and a society in which people were devoured and destroyed by a kind of malaise, cynicism and fatigue and anxiety. Institutions were failing. People took matters into their own hands and turned against their neighbors, turned on each other. And the prophet said over and over again that violence was everywhere. Everywhere you turn, there was violence. That was then, and this is now. And everywhere you turn, there is violence. Our nation, our world, seems to be in a kind of free fall. So much anger, and rage, and fear, and anxiety. Even our words have often become loaded missiles. We're consumed with guns and assault weapons and bombs. Violence here, violence there, violence everywhere. Violence toward women. Violence toward immigrants. Even what we call immigrants from the South, illegal aliens. As Maya Angelou reminded us, I am human and so nothing human can be alien to me. Violence. Violence toward the other, violence toward the poor, violence toward children, violence against people of color, violence even on our city streets, violence by the authorities of the state, violence in the name of religion and God, and violence in holy houses of prayer. Everywhere you turn, violence. Violence there, violence everywhere. So what shall we do? Arm our schools and churches and temples and mosques. What shall we do? Hunker down, circle the wagons, build that wall and build it high. Create fear and about the invasion of caravans of poor refugees from the south. Close and secure the border. Send down the troops build up the arsenal, privatize and withdraw from the public, private schools, private security systems, private health plans, private civic services, stop sharing, stop risking, stop reaching out, stop serving, stop giving, stop listening, stop loving, stop trying, stop dreaming, stop believing. Is that what we do? But Habakkuk the prophet says, don't stop, start something new. Stand up, speak out. Listen, Habakkuk offers an alternative to meeting violence with violence. He gives us a new narrative. Habakkuk says, this is what I will do. I'm going to go high. I'm going to stand up at my watch post. I'm going to station myself up on the rampart. I will keep watch to see what God will say to me. And what God will answer concerning my complaint. Then the Lord answered me and said, write the vision. Make it plain on tablets. Put it up in bright lights. Put it up on a billboard in big letters so that a runner may read it. Text it out. Tweet it out. Just any way to 
get it out. For there is a vision for the appointed time. It speaks of an end and does not lie. If it seems to tarry, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. The just shall live by faith. See the vision, the God-sized vision that God has for your life and the lives of others. See it, scan it, stand on it, stay with it, hold on to it, write it down. Violence is real, but there is still a vision. And if we can see it, it's the business of the prophet and the people of God to offer the vision to imagine a scenario of a coming future that is willed by God. A vision grounded in faith is enough to override and defeat violence. Imagine vision versus violence. Vision wins every time. Violence leaves victims. Vision leads to victory. It's a daring, bold, bodacious calculation because in our anxiety and fear we are mostly not available for vision but biblical faith is always in the business of vision believing that God's vision of the future will prevail over the death and destruction of the present so the business of the people of God is to go up high watch and wait for the vision write the vision down internalize it work for the vision give voice to the vision it's always a contest between violence and vision in the eyes of a frightened world violence will always veto vision because in our anxiety fear we can't really see beyond the present moment but faith in the eternal god in our midst is a refusal to succumb to give into to participate in anxiety and fear. Faith is confidence that the vision will prevail. Watch and wait for it. Work for it. Give voice to it. And you will know the vision when you see it. It's always big. It's always beautiful. It's always bold and bodacious. A vision of the prophets. Vision of Jesus. A vision of the spirit of the living God. The lame walking the blind seeing, the poor being lifted up, the oppressed being made free. It includes everybody, everybody in and nobody out. Watch and write it down, make it plain for everybody to see. Watch and work for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. It is a vision that cannot be denied. The God-sized vision of seeking deliverance from the damnable Decadent, deplorable, detestable, death-like dilemmas of life. Nothing works like definite, dogged, driving desire and determination. That's a demand that not even the deity can deny. There may be drama. There may be detours. There may be disruptions and delays, but it will not be derailed or denied. Don't worry about the villains of the vision. You just give voice to the vision. Don't worry about the villains of the vision. You just give voice to the vision. Don't worry about this uh, mega MAGA crowd. Even the big lie has term limits. Yes, it does. April the 4th. April the 4th, 1968. There may be a few of you in this auditorium today who will remember that day, April the 4th, 1968, I was 17 years old at an after-school job at Robinson Studio, a photographer's shop on Front Street in Indianola, Mississippi. And one of my co-workers came running into the room announcing that Martin Luther King Jr. had been shot in the head and I went numb. I couldn't believe it. Later that evening, we received the intelligence that Martin Luther King Jr. was dead. And in the early morning hours, I found myself on the corner of Roosevelt and Hannah Streets, Indianola, in the heart of the Mississippi Delta, walking 
and a car full of white youths sped around the corner. And one of them yelled out the window, we got Martin Luther Coon. And I felt rage. But more than that, I felt a whole plethora of emotions that came cascading in upon me almost at one time. I felt rage. I felt fear. I felt frustration. I felt anxiety. But more than that, I felt alone. I felt all by myself. I felt lonely. I felt deserted because my advocate had been taken away. I couldn't get the picture out of my mind. Martin Luther King Jr. dying on a balcony of hate and prejudice. His head had been opened by a 17 cent bullet of violence. And there he lay drowning in his own blood. Drowning in the blood of his love. Drowning in the blood of his commitment. Drowning in the blood of the actualizing of his oratory. And I felt rage. I felt frustration. I felt lonely. I felt deserted because my advocate had been taken away. Advocate in the Greek, parakletos, one who defends, one who vindicates, one who espouses a cause, one who comes to the aid of, one who comforts, one who makes me feel better. Parakletos, one who helps, one who I knew God had sent to help me and he got me in midstream and had been taken away. Paracletos, one who is called to your side. And we marched at the cadence of his oratory and he had been taken away. My advocate had been taken away. He was a voice for the voiceless. I cannot explain it, but he knew how to take all of my feelings of inadequacy. He knew how to take all of my feelings of being black in America, and he could take all of that collage of emotions and wrap it in language and regurgitate it, and I could say in union, that's me, that's what I've been feeling. He was my voice. He could articulate my feelings. Who was I, I when I could scream and nobody would pay me any attention because who was I, just another black boy from the Delta of Mississippi? Yet this black preacher from the red clay hills of Georgia could come to the center stage of life and declare my inner feelings and the whole world listen. But now my advocate had been taken away but more than my voice he was my conscience he was our conscience he made it uncomfortable for everybody he was white america's conscience he said when the architects of this great republic wrote the magnificent words of the declaration of independence and the constitution in a real sense they were signing a promissory note that every person has the inalienable right of life liberty and the pursuit of happiness but instead of honoring this sacred obligation america has given her people of color a bad check and it has come back marked insufficient funds he was white america's conscience but more than the conscience of white america he was the conscience of black America and of all people of color because he told black America that you can no longer sit in comfortable churches on comfortable pews and wear the evidence of your newfound prosperity while other folks are suffering in the pit of degradation. But all of us have got to stand up together for justice and freedom and go to jail if necessary and even put your life on the line. Rise up, O people of God. Have done with lesser things. Give heart and mind and soul and strength to serve the God of the universe. He put his life on the line by opposing Lyndon Johnson's war in Vietnam. Remind you that Lyndon Baines Johnson I was reminded just this morning on CBS Morning, was one of the best friends the civil rights movement has ever had in the White House. 
It was Lyndon Johnson who came here to this very campus and stood before the nation on these hallowed grounds and identified with black folks and intoned, we shall overcome. It was Johnson who signed the Civil Rights Bill of 1964 1965, 1968. It was Johnson who issued the first and only executive order demanding affirmative action. It was Johnson who envisioned a great society made free from ignorance and sickness and poverty, despair by means of Medicare, Medicaid, Head Start, CETA, Upward Bound, the Clean Water Act, the Voting Rights Act. Long before Katanji Brown Jackson, it was Lyndon Johnson who appointed Howard University Law School alum Thurgood Marshall, the first African-American and the only African-American to sit on the U.S. Supreme Court before Brown Jackson. Nevertheless, Martin Luther King Jr. would not allow himself to be co-opted even by our wonderful friend Lyndon Johnson. And there were many who didn't understand it. But today we praise God, not only because Martin King was politically involved, but because he was godly and faithful enough to maintain his integrity and ethical sensitivity. After he stood in the Riverside Church in New York City and came out against the war, the whole board of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference vetoed, voted not to support Dr. King's stand on the war. The White House closed its doors to Dr. King. Northern white liberals parted company with Dr. King. Highbrow intellectuals wondered out aloud if King really had the expertise to speak out on foreign issues. Some of our prominent Jewish friends defected from the civil rights movement. Roy Wilkins himself, African American of blessed memory and of the NAACP, denounced King's position. Carl Rowing chided Dr. King. The New York Times condemned King. Many black pastors closed their pulpits to Dr. King. Funding sources dried up, but he was so focused, so centered, he would not permit political expediency to narrow the scope of his spiritual conscience, his persistence, his love, his prophetic commitment. He was our conscience. Conscience is that which drags you through the uncomfortable. For even as he spelled out the enemy, he would not give us permission to hate them. He said, that's your enemy. Now love them. And when other voices said, hate them, Martin said, no, love your enemy. Pray for those who despitefully use you. And they killed him. And I stood on that street corner in Indianola, the heart of the Mississippi Delta, filled with rage and frustration and emptiness and loneliness because I had been deserted by my advocate. My conscience had been destroyed. My dreamer had been annihilated. My vision had been distorted. My dream had become a nightmare. And there I was full of rage and frustration because my advocate had been taken away. But 55 years later, I'm still here. And I'm not hopeless. And I'm not defeated. My voice had been taken away. My conscience had been wiped out. My dreamer had been annihilated. But 55 years later, I've got a voice, I've got a dream, I've got a conscience, and I've got a vision. It's because Martin Luther King Jr. was not the voice. I found out all that he was, was an echo. There was a voice before that voice. Before that voice have a voice, its voice. That was the first voice. And the second voice heard the first voice. And the second voice echoed the first voice. It was the first voice that declared before there was a then or there, before there was a when or where, let there be light. And there was light. It was the first voice that spoke the universe and humanity into existence and spoke again and said, it is good. It is very good. It is the first voice that declared God is love and love is of God. It was the first voice that declared let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. So the enemy 
didn't have its day 55 years ago. All the enemy dealt with was an echo, but the first voice went untouched. And the reason I still have a dream and a vision, though the voices of Martin and Malcolm and Mega and Marshall and Mandela and Maya are long gone, is because the first voice went untouched. God stands with us. We are never alone. Somebody said, God has no hands but our hands. But that's mighty funny. God made our hands without our hands. God has God's own hands and God's own ways of bringing to pass God's purposes. Jesus said, if I hold my peace, the rocks will cry out. Rocks were not made to do it. Geology was not made to do it. But if you won't do it, the rocks will do it. Uh, I, I, yeah. You see, before God had a Dean Richardson, God had a Thurman, a Hill, and a Crawford. Before God had a Thurgood Marshall, God had a Charles Hamilton Houston. Before God had a Martin Luther King, God had a W.E.B. Du Bois and a Frederick Douglass. Before God had a Kamala Harris, there was a Dorothy Height and a Shirley Chisholm and a Fannie Lou Hamer. Before Thomas Aquinas, there was an Augustine. Before an Augustine, there was an Ambrose. Before an Ambrose, there was a Polycarp. Before Polycarp, there was a Timothy. Before Timothy, there was a Paul. Before Paul, there was a John the Baptist. Before John, there was an Esther. Before an Esther, there was a Noah. Before Noah, there was an Adam. And before Adam, the morning stars sang together. And the sons and daughters of God shouted for joy. God can do this with or without you and me. Yes, God can. I declare God can. I know God will. And in the end, right will win. Truth crushed to earth will rise again. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. The wicked will cease from troubling. And the weary will be at rest. So I just came to tell you, hold to the vision. Keep on giving voice to the vision. Don't despair about the violence. Don't worry about the villains. Hold to the vision. The vision will lead us to victory. The vision cannot be denied. There may be drama. There may be detours. There may be delays, but never derailed or denied. I go to my seat with this. It's a takeaway. It's a take home, a takeaway word. One word, one word, one word. It's in the text. Maybe you missed it. A takeaway, one word, here it is. Add it to your vocabulary. When there's violence, when there's trouble and dark nights, when there are trials and tribulations, one word, one word when violence and trouble comes, one word, one word, it's a powerful word. I dare you to use it. I dare you to speak it. Use it when you're depressed. Use it when it seems to you and others that you're completely down and undone and out for the count. Use it when there seems to be no way out. Use it when you're at the end of your rope. One word, one word, one word. Here it is, here it is, one word. Surely, surely, one word, surely. Troubled, surely. Say it, confused, diagnosis not good. No light at the end of the tunnel. Sure. No justice. Sure. No peace. Sure. Violence everywhere. Sure. God is God. Surely God will rise again. Surely this too will pass. Surely we're going higher. Surely the sun will come. Surely behind every dark cloud there's a civil lining. Surely weeping endures for night, but joy comes in the morning. Surely, surely, surely. Before, I'm going to ask that um, everyone stand for the benediction. I'm going to ask something different. I'm going to ask the community choir to join the chaplains in the back because I'm so impressed with what you did this morning. Anyway, 
Let's give it to me. Because, I, and I witnessed this with the chapel choir. This signals to me a new day, a new beginning. This is what I call a call to chapel. Because you came not to sing, but to support and to pronounce your good news. And we need leadership like that. We need for you to be willing to do that, to serve in that kind of way. And that says a lot. And if I was a student, I would want to be part of what you're doing right now. So I'm going to say, amen. So I'm going to ask that you join us in the back and greet as the preacher comes. Because this is what Dr. Jackson is referring to about real leadership. It models not only his message, but his life knowing how to stand up front, but also to be guiding and leading from the sidelines. What a gift. for what eyes have seen. We thank you for what our ears have heard. And we thank you for what our hearts have felt. And now I said to the one who stood at the gate, give me a light that I may go out into the darkness and into the unknown. And she replied to me, go out into the darkness, go out into the unknown. But put your hand in the hand of God. And God shall be for you better than light and much safer than a known way. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace, both now and forever. Let the church say amen.